In the name of the Holy Trinity, one God, amen. Please be seated. Buenos dias, good morning. My name is Elisa Stebbing, and I am a curate at St. Paul San Pablo Episcopal Church in Houston, near the southeast corner of 610. So we share that lovely stretch of interstate. <laughs> It's wonderful to be with you here at Grace Episcopal Church on this Trinity Sunday. Our gospel today talks about what has come to be known as the Great Commission, which is the concluding message of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus sending out his disciples to make disciples of all nations. Much of my early ministry was caught up in this Great Commission before I started working for the Episcopal Church in 2006, I worked for Compassion International and eventually was the co-director of a nonprofit that worked with youth and trauma around the world using music and the arts. So I have witnessed and experienced how the Great Commission has gone wrong and also how it has gone right. In the Gospel of Matthew, we can see two phases of how the writer of this gospel has worked in the salvation history of Jesus the Christ. Matthew is keen that his mainly Jewish audience understand that those of the Jewish faith are not excluded from this good news, but through them it expands to all people. But what does it mean to make a disciple? I mean, is there a recipe for this? <laughs> How do we do this? I think we first have to take a look at how Matthew understood Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises. For Matthew, it is still the story of the Hebrew people in which Jesus fulfills a promise God made to Abraham from the very beginning. I will make you a great nation and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12. Matthew opens this gospel with a genealogy that starts with Abraham, showing how it was God's design all along that salvation should be extended through the Hebrew people to all nations, all ethnicities, and all cultures. The entire gospel of Matthew portrays Jesus as the new Moses, carrying forward the promises of God made to Abraham, Moses, and all of the other prophets. Jesus, like Moses the prophet, will lead God's people out of bondage into a new freedom. Today, we are held in bondage of our own fears. And while those of us sitting here today may not be in literal slavery, we are nevertheless still held captive with the consequences of that evil. With Jesus, the doors are blown open and this new exodus we forge through the desert to bring new and true freedom for all nations and all peoples. So the Gospel of Matthew begins with this genealogy. I know reading genealogies can be boring but if you pay attention, they can be full of surprises. Many people here have pursued their own lineages through programs like Ancestry.com and have found a few surprises. <laughs> it's pretty interesting when you dig deep and find out who you're related to. Well, there are plenty of those kinds of surprises in Jesus' family heritage as well. Let me point out some of them. In the royal gene genealogy listed in Matthew, there are five points where women are mentioned, which in and of itself was shocking at the time. Of course, we have Mary, his mother. She became pregnant with Jesus as a single unwed girl. The rest of these women include an adulterer, Bathsheba, the wife of a Gentile, and quite possibly not consenting. A woman of incest, Tamar, who may have also been a Gentile, and two women of foreign origin, Ruth and Rahab, who was a prostitute. 
There is no apparent reason for Matthew to include these women in an otherwise patriarchal genealogy, except that the evangelist was animated by a keen sense of ethnic and religious inclusiveness. Not only that, but the message that even Paul picks up later in the Christian story is that nothing, not even these shame-filled labels, can separate one from the love of God and from being an important participant in God's story. Jesus, as the new and superior Moses, expands the promises of God to free God's people, to go with us day and night into the wilderness, just like God was with the Hebrew people in the desert, and to take us into a new home where we all belong. And here's where Jesus turns things around, like he liked to do. <laughs> this time is not by annihilating other people groups in the name of God, but by the way of peace. Not by coercion, but by the way of living out the active love of God in our own lives. Jesus made disciples by teaching by explaining the mystery of God's love for us in a way that is often counter to our human nature. Too often, we've taken matters into our own hands and tried to force people into following Jesus, and the results have been disastrous. That's not making disciples. That's taking hostages. Forcing the way of love makes it anything but a way of love and ends up looking like the genocide of indigenous peoples, slavery for our own profit, beating on Bibles and excluding some of God's beloved children like our LGBTQ siblings. The Jesus movement was meant to be an inclusive one, opening the doors for healing, peace, restoration, and the way of love. Jesus' example of making disciples of all nations first included a vagabond group of men and women who were deeply flawed, mostly uneducated, rough around the edges, and yet what made them worthy to do this job was their deep desire to love God and their devotion to following Jesus. Those were their qualifications. Throughout their time with Jesus, they learned what loving their neighbor meant, and that it also took learning to love oneself. Seeing themselves as Jesus saw them, seeing ourselves as Jesus sees us. They had to learn to get over the scandal that Jesus would sit by a well in the heat of the day and talk with a woman from a despised ethnicity who had had too many husbands. They had to learn to help the blind see, accept Jesus' preference for the poor, keep the religious leaders from stoning an adulteress, see all people as equal in their need for healing, and feed the hungry. They also learned from Jesus that humility requires us to come as guests to people's land and homes, and to realize that our own salvation is tied to listening and learning from the wisdom of the poor and the disenfranchised and what they have to offer us. The authority that Jesus gave his disciples was found in the baptism through the Almighty God, Son, and Holy Spirit. None of this work is done without the triune God dwelling in every aspect of our being and our lives. Jesus, standing on a mountain, just like Abraham, Moses, and Joshua did, carries forward the same promise to his disciples that God had given them. I will be with you always. This is how we make disciples, my friends through the indwelling of the Trinity, our parent, 
our friend, and our advocate. Our preaching, our teaching, writing, or anything we say about God is empty without this relationship. It is an active love being lived out in a world that is toxic, hateful, and unkind. Our actions, our ability to see God in each person, especially those that seem the least likely to be acceptable, regardless of religion or ethnicity or gender or abilities or any differences, is the business of disciple making. This triune God is not one of coercion. God does not coerce the Son into submission of God's will, nor does the Holy Spirit manipulate the Son. The interaction of the three persons of the Trinity is one of self-giving, the way Jesus modeled discipleship for us. Jesus invites us into a mutual partnership of this divine life. We are given the power to invite others into this life. He does not leave us alone in this work, nor does he leave us powerless. He promises his presence and a power that does not coerce, but serves and persuades by example by our actions. Making disciples requires us to be faithful disciples of God's love and promises and to include all of God's children. From the promise to Abraham, through the prophet Moses, Jesus, through the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, promises to be with us in the work until his return. As Thomas Merton said, the beloved Trappist monk, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business, and in fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do is to love, and this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. So my friends, go out from this place today with the power of the Holy Spirit to serve your God, to follow Jesus, and fulfill the Great Commission by your example of love. Amen.